Just a quick look at the numbers. UCLA is absolutely set up for success against Colorado this week. As long as they avoid the... You are locked on UCLA. Your daily podcast on the UCLA Bruins. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome, everybody, to this edition of the Locked On UCLA Podcast. I'm your host, Zach Anderson Yoxheimer. Thanks for making the show your first listen each and every day. It's free where we do your podcast, and it's available on YouTube. So like, comment, and subscribe if you're never dare. Hey, thanks for tuning in and giving some love. Review, comment, everything in between this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn because every potential new hire can feel like a high-stakes wager for your small business. That's why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right t- people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com. college. Terms and conditions apply. The Bruins and the traveling circus that is the Colorado Buffaloes and the Sanders family and all of Colorado and all the celebrities will be heading to Pasadena this week in an absolute exciting ball game. The homecoming festivities. You've got almost the A team for the, the ESPN broadcast coming after Kirk Herbstreit's going to fly from college game day and then get his way over to Pasadena to watch UCLA take on Colorado. A game in which the Bruins are favored by a lot. But it's going to mean a lot for the fans because this is going to be one of the biggest crowds for the Bruins, arguably, since prior to COVID, based on what we're expecting with the tarps coming off, 70,000, uh, a sellout, quote-unquote, with all the Colorado fans coming, the UCLA fans maybe sneaking their way in. You know, we'll, we'll see what it looks like in the Colorado based on the fan distribution or just from the sheer excitement with this being the only SoCal trip this season for Colorado and Shooter Sanders and company as they come to the L.A. area, if you will, to watch the Bruins hopefully lay the beat down on the Colorado Buffaloes. This is a game where UCLA can set themselves up for success the rest of the way. They've still got the Cows, the Arizona schools, and at USC. This is a game that can kind of give those expectations, right? One of those, there's one game on the schedule down the stretch Probably where the UCLA Bruins are going to have some expect to have some success, only to see some resistance from the opposition. Could it be Colorado? Is it Arizona? Is it Arizona State? Is beyond the SC game because that means so much more emotionally. Is it the Cal game at home? What is it? One of those games where the Bruins will be favored or nearly favored as the higher ranked team to lead themselves into a victory against a team they should beat kind of handily. If you look at the numbers, it, first for the offense, right? Let's take a look at the offensive numbers for UCLA. They need to win. They will win and do so easily if they avoid the turnover bug, which you know could have been addressed, one, with Chip Kelly switching from Dante Moore to Ethan Garbers. Now, Chip Kelly's not come out and confirmed. This is back to week one, week two shenanigans, and we kind of know how that is. We're just going to wait. I'm of the mindset that I think Chip Kelly knows who his starting quarterback is. I think he'll lean Ethan Garbers. I know he has said Dante Moore was injured, and that is what led to the potential switching in the previous week's practice before the Stanford game. We can all read between the lines. You know, Dante came out after the end of, at the end of the game off the bench through four or five completions, whatever. It's not about that. It's about whoever starts. And most importantly, something we have not touched since I did this episode today, Chip Kelly would ask by Ben Bolton in the media scrum was saying Colin Schley is back at practice and debating and erasing all the hypotheticals. Schley could potentially be available. So UCLA could use their three headed monster. He could go back to Moore and usually they could do Garbers and usually, or some of you may have been saying usually exclusively. I'm not entirely sure I'm on that bandwagon just yet. But we'll probably see two or three UCLA quarterbacks in this game, depending on how things play out. They've got to avoid the turnover. The one thing Colorado has been good at this season is forcing turnovers via interceptions. And that's the one thing the Bruins have sucked at because despite being a top 15 team in the country and picking off opponents, they are the worst team in the Pac-12 at avoiding interceptions. Colorado in the conference, 
is amongst the top three teams of intercepting passes. The Bruins, number one conference. Colorado, they're in, they have eight interceptions. So this is a game where UCLA can find themselves in some dire straits if they throw a pick, which can be negated depending on who's at starting quarterback. Still, all the numbers favor UCLA having a lot of success for this game. Colorado easily could give up even more yards and less success than what Stanford did. Colorado and Stanford are pretty much neck and neck in having the worst defense in the Pac-12, which is why when the two teams played, they played a high-scoring shootout, even though Colorado jumped out to a big lead. UCLA, again, another key this week is going to be one. Beyond the turnovers, how do the Bruins fare on third downs? In this game, UCLA is facing the second-worst third-down defense in the conference. And coming into the game against Stanford, Stanford was the worst, or one of the worst, against defending defense, defending third downs. UCLA, prior to the Stanford game in the conference of champions, was near the bottom. They're about 10 in the conference of 12, and they converted about 30% of the time, a little more than that. After a 10 for 18 conversion rate, you change that, it's 5 for 9, whatever convert, you know, depending on how you want to do your math, the Bruins jumped up to over 42%. They've been successful on third downs, and they went to now the middle of the pack, just converting that many third downs against the Stanford Cardinal. So the Bruins hopefully can have a lot more success. If it's Garbers, if it's Schlee, if it's more, whoever it is, the opportunity is open to keep the ball, keep the ball moving, and move the ball against a team that generally does not get a lot of stops. Colorado when it comes to third down conversion defense, is second worst in the Pac-12. 45% they allow the teams to be successful in third down. The Bruins actually have a much a little bit worse clip. They're about 43%. Still, the Bruins are working their way up. After a slow start, they got much better just by one game's worth against a defense that numbers-wise is similarly reflected to what Colorado is going to bring. Now, after a bye week, I don't know what they're going to change. I'm not sure what UCLA is going to bring with quarterback schematics. If Chip Kelly wants to get weird and actually play three quarterbacks like he's promised us before in a game that's not a blowout, we'll see if that actually happens. It should be, in my mind, what I'm expecting, a garbers Schley combination of Schley's help healthy, or we could see something completely bonkers, in which case I'll just throw my palms to the air and we'll just look at each other through the lens of the podcast, through YouTube, and you're just like, what's going on? I don't know. Colorado, in most facets of the game, have areas where they struggle significantly to generate a lot of pressure, to find ways to get to the quarterback, to, other than forcing turnovers, just to simply get stops overall, which is what we've seen when they played Colorado State. TCU, USC, Oregon, the list goes on and on until they played Stanford. Now, have they revamped their entire defense in a week? No. Is Travis Hunter a boss both sides of the football? Absolutely. But he can't be making big-time plays. And even still, can if you're a good receiver, make a catch on his helmet and wrestle it into the end zone for a touchdown in overtime. Plays are there to be made. And this is going to be a very pass-happy game for UCLA. Hopefully, if they don't just throw it straight into the arms of an awaiting Colorado DB's hands. So many opportunities for the Bruins offense to just blow past the defense that is numerous throughout the NCAA stat website, throughout every little thing. They're just bad. They're just not that good. And there's been a lot of improvements for Colorado this year and sheer excitement, everybody paying attention to them, everything in between. This is a game where UCLA should be successful. If you avoid the turnover, it would be a fairly easy day, we hope. Now, defensively, there's a flip side too, the good and the bad. What does that mean for UCLA's defense? We'll tell you next on Locked On UCLA. The UCLA Colorado game is going to be an exciting one nonetheless, which is why you should go to Prize Picks to play some daily fantasy sports. PrizePicks.com slash locked on college to get things started because it's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. All you got to do is on two to six players with their stat projections, choose more or less. Now, is it sacks, yards, everything in between? This is a fascinating game because there's so many different possible outcomes. 
whether Colorado comes to play or the Bruins lay the beat down and we have fun on national television. That's why you're going to want to go and see if your willing, winnings roll in with prize picks because it's easy to get quick withdrawals, gameplays easy, enormous selection of players, and they've got Taco Tuesday benefits where it discounts each player's projections up to 25%. All you have to do is go to prizepicks.com slash locked on college, use the code locked on college for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, prizepicks.com slash locked on college and use the code locked on college for a deposit match up to $100. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Meanwhile, if Chip Kelly doesn't find a way to beat the Colorado Buffaloes, there will be more UCLA fans calling for his head. And I'm not sure that's where it's going to go. But if you're a small business, though, and looking for someone to fill your open vacancy, every potential new hire feels like a high-stakes wager, whether you're looking for a football coach, small business, or if you're looking for that new good coworker, that teammate that you need. You want to be 100% certain that they're going to fit in as the best act get, want to get the best access to the best qualified candidates they've got screening questions to get the right candidates to interview and then eventually hire and small businesses rate linkedin jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus leading competitors all you got to do is go to linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free that's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free terms and conditions apply Cruising on, next segment of the Locked On UCLA podcast, we're talking the UCLA defense. Because this is a defense that despite forcing a lot of turnovers, despite getting the football back and being really good, the Bruins aren't undefeated. That's just how it is. And with a team that's gained 16 turnovers, that's how many turnovers they force. That's just the word lingo the NCAA likes to use. When it comes to turnover margin, they're only fifth best in their own conference because the Bruins have turned it over so many times this season. With a defense that's absolutely been ball hawks every game, they force turnovers in each and every of the seven games, at least one, whether it be a pick, a fumble forced, and a recovery. Multiple times they force turnovers against Stanford and against other opponents. The Bruins are looking to do the same against the Colorado team that does not turn over the football. A team that forces turnovers, that's what they pride themselves on. They give up a lot of yards. You could argue that's the similar thing to the Alex Grinch defense when it was I don't even know if it was working in 2022, but it did something the year previous, that team across town that's having trouble on defense, or what Colorado's doing in 2023. They just also pride themselves on taking care of the football. They are, hey, a team that knows how to take care of the football and be opportunistic, like when they forced TCU into so many turnovers in week one when the Horn Frogs were driving deep in their in Colorado territory, they made plays over and over again to the Buffs, highlighted by that Hunter pick. He's done many big plays, as the Buffaloes have, to get the job done. The difference is, for UCLA defensively against Colorado, it's all about the pressure. I'm not entirely sure Shadir Sanders is going to throw up a terrible, terrible pick in a crucial part of the game like he did in his most recent game in overtime. But you can get on the fact that we should expect Latsu, the Murphy twins, uh, to we everybody on the defensive line, even some of the linebackers, should be in the backfield at some point tugging on Sanders' jersey, wanting to get him down to the ground consistently. We thought UCLA's offensive line was not that good, right? That's just how it's been. The Bruins have not been the most spectacular offensive line in pass protection when you look at the numbers for sacks allowed. That has been an area where the Bruins have struggled this year. Colorado has been much, much worse. And you're facing what is easily, probably, most definitely, or not, if you're going to argue against, the, the best defensive front in the Pac-12. A lethal defensive line, which we, yeah, I can throw many adjectives out there. Dance and Lade can use the same thing. Chip Kelly, even Leatu Latu, who's getting some top 10 love in the most recent NFL mock drafts. This can be a coming out party where he says, coach, don't take me off the field. I'm going to sack Shadir Sanders like 5 billion times and burst through this Colorado offensive line that might double team him, maybe triple team him, whatever they need to do to slow him down and free up his teammates. That will see Shadir Sanders running for his football life on the field. That's the hope. That's the thought for this game that the Bruins can have success. Now, the problem is, 
if he escapes, if he shows the ability to maneuver and do some magic as he's done at times this year, maybe not so much against the Pac-12, but in non-conference games and in uh, times when Colorado's been successful offensively, the Bruins will have to rely on this secondary defense, which when you look at the team passing efficiency defense, a big long phrase to say they're a top 20 team against guarding the pass. Other than that Oregon State game, the Bruins have largely done a much better job one, because they've intercepted passes, they've done a better job of closing out since the Coastal Carolina game at defending the long ball and balls deep over their heads in the secondary, help with Davies, help with Kamari Ramsey. So many different players have been making plays, like in Alex Johnson as well. The Bruins have come in out of nowhere, helped by their front seven, made it a lot easier for the secondary continuing to make plays. Now, it's going to come down to pressure, pressure, pressure. For UCLA, if you get some pressure, you're going to be running three men in the backfield and having fine ways to get easy sacks, tackles for loss, which I think the Bruins should have upwards of five to six sacks and then 11 to 12 tackles for loss. That is my thoughts in this game. That is what I think the Bruins should have, and it can be against the Colorado offensive line that's just so porous at this moment, right? Deion Sanders can do whatever he wants to flip the roster over in one year. And he's done a great job at making Colorado a great story. And they can still find a way to snag this one. But there are still holes on this roster that UCLA has major strengths this year. And they've exploited for other teams. And they must, should, probably will, and dominantly so, exploit against Colorado. It's getting pressure on Sanders, who probably won't throw a pick or two in this game. He could, it's likely, but... I don't know, maybe not likely. It's possible, not likely he's going to make same dumb mistakes he's made with two weeks to think about that that Stanford game, that bad taste in the mouth. Or is this a Colorado team that's going to wilt after that dismal performance and they've just sat on their feet, sat on their, sat on their hands for two weeks, twiddling their thumbs while Sanders has found ways to try and get the energy back in the building because it's different when you're looking to compete for a national championship from all the betters. Now, it's come back to earth and realize a program transformation, which I'm fairly confident Deion Sanders knew, despite what he may or may not say to the media. He's a smart guy. It's going to take more than one year. He wants to do it quick. It was just not going to happen completely in 2023. They've had a good building block, but the Bruins can still exploit a lot of the holes that Colorado has in this game, where the Bruins are going to wear the jump men throwback uniforms, The Terry Donahue statue is going to be unveiled, many different players, the Heisman winner in Gary Beeman, the national championship winning team of 54 will be honored. National television, a packed stadium, we hope, in what is not going to be a blazing Rose Bowl Saturday in late October, UCLA can find ways to dominate, and I think they can. They're set up for success offensively, defensively, no, a lot of numbers favor the Bruins. There are some categories where Colorado can take advantage, where the Bruins have not been able to be as successful, where it's taking care of the football and the Bruins pride themselves in forcing turnovers. That's not exactly what Colorado does, at least from Shadir Sanders throwing picks over and over again, which can make it interesting in this one now that they've had rest, some time to stew over that dreadful second half and double overtime performance against Stanford I just wonder if the Bruins will be facing a different beast. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. I still believe the Bruins can win this one and do so. Maybe not by 17, but do so. They're set up for success against the Buffaloes. Now, we're going to wrap up the show, talk about some Jaime Hawkins Jr. and rave about his NBA debut because the NBA started. Let's get hyped here on Locked On UCLA. I'm not sure whether UCLA is going to cover the Colorado spread, right? If you look at FanDuel Sportsbook, close to three scores, about 17 points right at home for the Bruins. It'll be an interesting one. But you're going to want to go to FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook, and try, if you're a new customer, to get those $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you just place a $5 bet. Do that on the UCLA game. You should try that. Win or lose, $200 in bonus bets because there's no better time if you're thinking about joining FanDuel than doing it right now because it's a super easy to use app, wide range of betting options. All you got to do is go to FanDuel.com slash locked on and kick off the NFL season and enjoy some college football with it. FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL.
Getting ready to wrap up things here on Locked On UCLA. Zach Anderson, Yoxheimer with you guys. And the Bruins. Hey, we've talked a little bit of basketball. We've talked about what they've lost for men's basketball. What did they lose? An NBA first rounder. Rookie of the year, Jaime Hawkins Jr. Well, we'll stop it right there. We won't get that ridiculous because you've got Victor Wemuyana. We got words. I can't even. Why am I not saying his name? You've got the super big 7 3 super crazy star in San Antonio. You've got Shit Holmgren, who's coming back from the foot injury, who could easily compete. I'm not going to go on the list of who's going to be NBA Rookie of the Year, but it's Jaime Hawkins Jr. And we're going to take a look at what he did for the Miami Heat in his first official non-summer league performance in the NBA. Now, in preseason, whatever, he appeared and got his first true bucket, stole a pass, a little ring around the rosy on the rim, three for three, six points, 13 minutes, couple of assists, couple of rebounds, couple of steals. That's exactly what the Miami Heat needed, getting a Jaime Hawkins Jr., who probably won a lot by not getting traded in the hypothetical Damian Lillard trade that would have sent him to Portland, would have played a lot of big minutes, but he can develop in a different way on a contending team for a player that's just an absolute winner, probably fits in the locker room. I can't say that specifically, but with the guys who have competed and made it to the NBA Finals a couple of times in the in the 2020 year, in earlier in 2023 against the Nuggets, this is a team that's needing some youth, some tenacity, and some toughness. And all UCLA fans know Jaime Hawkins Jr. can do that, which maybe is one of the key reasons why the Heat did not make sure the trade happened. Maybe not make sure the thing happened, but they didn't go fully after Damian Lillard with Hawkins as a trade piece. I'm not sure what happened, but after Lillard got sent away, maybe the Heat are left to say, you know, what's up? Instead, Hawkins got his way through Summer League, got his way on the roster, showing off that fancy footwork in an eventual Miami Heat successful night. We'll see what happens, how it develops. But again, he's a good fit for Miami, for a team that's looking to win, looking to contend now. With the Jimmy Butlers, whether it's the prima donna, a little diva side hair on media day that he showcased, with the, the three-point shooting barrage that the Miami Heat can bring, it is a former Bruin who has to trade his blue in for some red. We'll let it suffice as, he can, as long as he can have a good NBA career, and I think that's a good starting spot. I'm not exactly sure we're going to sit here saying Hawkins Jr. is going to be a 20-year star with the Miami Heat, but I do think that is a good starting spot and can be a good spot for him to springboard into an NBA career where he hopes to be a role model for his community and find ways to be a very successful NBA player in different ways, whether it's improving his three-point shot, improving his already incredible footwork, and adding that defensive intensity in today's day and age of an NBA that just does not have that consistently in the regular season, and he can bring that, whether it's 10-minute, 13-minute bursts. The Heat were plus four with him on the floor, and that is only going to continue, I think, with the Jaime Hawkins Jr. we know, unless he's just not hitting his shots, which you have to do in the NBA to play, but it's his defense, his calm, cool collection on the court that makes him such a cool character when, to be drafted in the first round. That's why it took him four years to fully develop make Pac-12 player of the year, the award he won, and keep the Bruins always consistently in the postseason. He can be one of those guys that gets a decent amount of minutes when the playoffs come around. If the Heat don't decide to f- mess around with the 6, 7, and 8 seeds and the 9 and 10 seeds for the play-in tournament, they can find a way to get a little higher with a rookie like a Hawkins Jr. The pump fakes everything. He's showcasing more and more in that NBA debut, so we're happy that he did it. a couple of points. Filling up the stat sheet in every way, right? Not the turnovers and everything bad, but filling it up a stat stuffer and doing everything to make plays happen, which is why we're proud for Jaime Hawkins Jr. NBA debut, congrats to the former Bruin. Can't wait for Jalen Clark to get healthy. Can't wait to see how Amari, Amari Bailey develops in his NBA career. And eventually, it'll be a dim bone out there. Maybe some of these new freshman Bruins In the next year or years to come, we hope they just have more UCLA success before that and they can join Hawkins Jr. as former Bruins in the NBA because, hey, the Bruins are filling the NBA rosters. Not every single player because now they're all international players first, but all the UCLA players. Hey, let's get it done. Hands up, Bruins fans. Eight clap time, baby. If you're in every day or stay tuned, Locked on UCLA's next episode a prediction, full keys to the game episode as we get excited for UCLA and the Colorado Buffaloes on Locked on UCLA. 
I'm Zach. I'm signing off. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. U C L A. U C L A. Fight, fight, fight. This has been Locked On UCLA. Go Bruins.